Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Fantastic. Can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, so you did, I was just about to resend that um, invitation because I thought maybe you hadn't gotten it. I don't know if I received it. I guess my computer or the network is so slow to just Oh, get yes. I mean, everybody's at home using their electronics, so I'm sure there's lag time everywhere. Yeah. So, um, first, what I, I would like to start off with is to discuss your um, scores, what, what they mean and what we should focus on. And then um, I guess we can decide later at the end of today's session how you'd like to um, schedule your other sessions and what you would like to put the most focus on during your, your next four sessions. So what I'll do is I'll start with your report, which um, considering you've never taken the exam was not so, not so bad. And they have, it's a little bit different, the grouping. One moment, please. I'm gonna go, let me see. Yeah, right. And we'll discuss what they, let me see. I, I will be right back, okay? Sure. I can't hear you. Well, I can't hear you. Thank you so much. Um, I was putting the children upstairs. They're being a bit loud. So this is a bit different than what your score report will look like when you take the exam. When you take the exam, it's going to be, um, it's going to come from these domains, which you should be familiar with. This is the um, Pearson. We used to be ETS, but now it is, it, the testing organization is through Pearson. So it's now Pearson. And I actually believe they took these off of the website. I don't think that they're on there anymore. But in any event, the four domains that you'll be tested on um, are listed here. And you'll see that they don't quite correlate with, um, oh my Lord, with what you have here. Domain four is usually roles and responsibilities and that has to do with uh, laws and other duties that we just have to, we're obligated to do. The ones that tend to give people the most difficulties are um, learning development, evaluation and achievement in ELA and mathematics. And those areas are for the testing purposes um, on domains two and three. And those are actually the most highly tested areas. So you have 66% of the entirety of the exam comes from those two domains. So it behooves us to really delve into domain two and domain three to make sure that we have um, a clear understanding of each of the standards and like what those standards are referring to. And so 
the way I'd like to begin is to, like I said, go over your, uh, your scores and what they say, but then also um, show you the um, tools that I'm going to give you, the Mometrics PDF, which I told you doesn't have a, a great uh, set of questions for you to practice with, but as far as content is concerned, roles and responsibilities, dates for when legislature was passed for spe special ed, all of those things are gonna be in there. And so the way that I like to use these two PDF documents, the one that used to be provided by the state for us to study, which is now gone, um, and the one with Mometrics, is using the standards, and I'm gonna go specifically to domain two because that's the one that is a bit more um, challenging for test takers promoting student learning and development. So going through these areas and looking up terms in each of them, making sure that you understand each standard individually. And what I tell all of my students is if you could explain to someone in your own words what this looks, what the standard would look like in your classroom and what sort of things you would need to use and do in order to achieve it, then you know that standard. If you come to a standard and you are unfamiliar with any of the terminology or things that they're referencing, then we have to reference it with the Mometrics books to bridge that gap in content um, knowledge that's missing. So what we're gonna go through is um, sort of strategies later to be able to delve into what exactly the question is asking because each of these exams are written in such a way as to be confusing. So um, yes. They, they lead you to believe, oh, this, this must be what they're asking, when in fact it's not what they're asking. And so training yourself to practice with each, each question, say, what is the question asking me? What is the teacher's goal here? And what, do I, what keywords do I need to make sure I, I pay, particular, um, pay particular attention to? So in looking at this, I saw that you had said that your ELA was a little bit weaker, right? You said that yesterday? Yes. Okay, so and that, that did show up in your, um, in your score report, but that's not that big of a deal because this right here, this phone means an alphabetic principle, it's not difficult. It's just not everyone received that instruction. And what phonemes are is they're just individual speech sounds like ah, nt. And so individual speech sounds, the way that we use the alphabetic principle and, and the state is changing actually this year and next year where they're getting extremely more rigorous with and demanding with the um, reading instruction that all teachers do within their classroom, not just English and language arts. So that's going to mean um, all EC through six, all elementary teachers are gonna be required to be certified in the science of teaching reading. And that really delves deeply into the different um, portions of the science of te teaching reading that need to be activated and built upon so that you know everything takes place and happens. Phonemes in the alphabetic principle is at the very beginning. It's the absolute most important. Research shows that if students do not have strong phoneme and alphabet, alphabet uh, awareness where they know sound, letter sound correspondence, they're going to have difficulties reading, hands down. And the, the stronger that they are in those phonemes, because English has weird speech sounds that were like the, unlike Spanish, that language, uh, if you sound out the sounds, you will say the word sort of like it said. We have words in English where that isn't the case. There's a rule to it, so it's I before you said. So you have to learn specialized uh, phonemic sounds, right? So what, what do this group of letters, what does this sound mean? What is this uh, word part, this morpheme, which is what a, a word part is, what does that mean? And getting them to, for that to be sort of common knowledge for them starting in elementary and then sort of hammering it in all the way through is going to make a difference in our reading and writing classes. So I have a, uh, a specialized um, sort of presentation for that for ELA, which we'll do on a, a later date. But I wanted to uh, go into the standards themselves and sort of go over the entire framework and then jump into right here with your learning development with cultural impacts, 
um, classroom management, transition teaching, because these ones are going to have to do with um, your ability to tie in those pedagogical standards in with what you know about special ed. So how do I make adjustments to my learning when there are um, cultural nuances in the classroom? And how would those adjustments serve to, to bring success to the students? So we'll talk about that a little bit and how important bringing um, sort of like exalting and um, highlighting myriad cultures within a classroom helps to bolster all student success. It makes them less likely to be fearful in interactions with others. And so all that goes into play. Um, do you have any questions? No, I mean, so far you're right on it. I mean, like I said, I know what my weakness is. Right, you, you were spot on, absolutely. So. Um, let's start off a little bit with life skills. I wanted to start off with these two because they were at zero. These yeah. uh, impacts of, and there were only two questions, so it's not like, you know, it's, it's well, really very telling. I Do normally, remember those questions? yeah, well, I remember the questions. My biggest thing was, I guess my mindset was all about not individual versus grouping. Right. So, you know, testing time i've been looking for those words as as far as you know grouping collaborating you know have helped the students do the activities something that is engaging right. so i was when the answer choice were very similar i end up choosing not individual versus the grouping and i think a lot of them had you know individual oh, so sorry, my five-year-old, she likes to interrupt. Okay, no, it's fine. Um, absolutely. Um, I'm sorry, what, what were you saying right now? You, you just so, Like I said, I think my biggest- the one where there was a difference between one was individual and one was collaborative. And so, yeah, they're gonna use those words just to hint you, do they want this to be one or the other? Um, yeah. And sometimes they're extremely tricky where I still get tricked on them. And then I go back and I look, I'm like, man, they were, they were good on that yeah. one. So I think that was my thing is I, last time I taken PPR, a lot of questions were collaboration, mm -hmm. not individual. Right. So in the, the special ed is definitely collaboration slash individual because you are helping the individual needs to right. fulfill the area of the, whatever the needs are. So I feel like I think that's what the, when I, when I took it, I really didn't think about it. I was really focusing on only grouping. Right. And so technically you're right. But with special ed, we have, um, and, and like everything else, like all the other classrooms, but especially with special ed, because we are required by law with their individualized education plan, their IEP. And so because of that, there isn't that cohesiveness in the group sort of collaborative setting. However, it is still so important for us to create activities in which the students who have IEPs collaborate with each other and whatnot. And so, yeah, that it is both and, and typically it is still the same, just making sure that within that collaborative group, everybody's individual needs as addressed in the IEP are, are taken care of. So that's the difference between those regular settings and, and the, a special ed classroom. Yeah, I, I feel like culturally, I think a pie will be able to be okay with it. Life skill, I have no idea. I was like shooting in the blind and figured, <laughs> I have no idea. So I was just kind of guessed on it. Well, let's uh, do what, what I'd like for you to do. Um, where is I'm gonna look at the Mometrics and we're gonna take a look at what Mometrics has to say about life skills. So I've been in many uh, life skills class. I've never taught it myself, but uh, just as an administrator and as a intern supervisor, and, and it, it's where you have your um, not MR students, it's not the self-contained, but they do stay there and, and they will be taken for pull out. But in that classroom, there might be a, a sink, some dishes, there might be a stove and a microwave, there, there might be um, a dishwasher and maybe some like a washing machine. The last one that I visited was so great because their curriculum was 
based around a, a project. Their life skills class was going to be the coffee shop for the teachers. So they were, this was at an idea campus. And so, I mean, these are kids who are, are, are very, very learning disabled and um, they have difficulties interacting, doing social interactions with other students. So all, every interaction is not, it's not just a academic and we're not teaching them just how to do math. We're teaching them how to like grab the money and look them in the eyes or like, move the dish let's clean this dish or how to so teaching them skills that they can use in their life not academically so mm -hmm. skills that that would make their lives easier um that they might not have been taught and what was interesting about this one particular school is that their entire curriculum was was built around this keep maintaining this um staff coffee club or coffee shop and so they the teacher the life skills teacher got permission and once a week they'd go and they would purchase the stuff themselves so the students would go look for for the coffee look for the filters look for the little things they would graph how much they sold um what people liked what people didn't like based on their their sellings and so it was a, a they had to clean a whole bunch of stuff it, it, so everything was sort of based around keeping this small project built and they brought in english and and writing as as needed all throughout the entirety of the way um so that was really interesting but let's take a look what the dictionary definition of a uh, life skills we're not going to find it all one word okay so here is where you'll go to get like very very detailed information on different um disabilities that they might have you you're familiar with dyslexia right and dyslexia uh, yes. right and then dyscalculia and that's with with math right so with numbers mm -hmm. um dysgraphia with uh difficult writing. For, right so writing their um with their auditory and verbal um and nonverbal learning disabilities so let me see where the life skills is at I think my biggest issue is life skills that I have never dealt with and autism. Um, that's also, an, um, I had only one child over the course of 10 years in my mm -hmm. career. So I really am not familiar with autism. He was, most of the time he was out of my class. Well, I think that now they have, so you, okay, I see what you're saying. So um, now I think almost every campus has an entire class that's life skills. Um, and so they just go out to other, they, they get pulled out and they go that way. There is the least restrictive environment. They're not self-contained, but um, it really is laying a foundation for the students to be able to go through the daily functions of life. So tying your shoelaces for some might be, and obviously there's a different range of skill that is available, right. which is fine because students learn from each other. And so um, they will help each other in learning from each other's modelings and their differences of skills. But um, this can be anywhere from hygiene to housework. Um, obviously there's going to be academic um lessons within those life lessons as well so it's not um predominantly life skills they do do math they do talk about um history and social studies they do go into elar and reading so um but the primary purpose of a life skills class is to make them be able to be semi self-sufficient um, and have those skills that make their lives more man manageable outside of the classroom. I'm trying to find the exact um, definition for you. Okay, here it is. Uh, 
So we need to help them acquire skills needed to function independently in the world. And that might be, um, I don't know why this doesn't have it all together. Let's take a look at a great life skills class. I wish I had pictures from before. Um, the kids were amazing and they loved it. They loved going shopping. They loved being like little baristas at the end of it. Um, let's see. I'll show you. Okay, here's Judson. Judson's a great school district, um, in, like a little bit in San Antonio. I like the, not sure. Where are you located? Katie, right? Katie, yeah. Excellent. That's a good school district as well. That's very, very good. So um, life skills, otherwise known as LS classes, are designed to meet the needs of students who have a intellectual, developmental, and academic levels so delayed that it um, would not serve them to be with the general education population. So they, they have those um, those pullouts to classes where they're um, within the art where they de deemed it was acceptable, right? Where they would be able to function without a level of frustration that's gonna um, make it unfeasible. The focus is to teach functional skills in academics, daily life, daily living, vocational. So they might teach, they might bring somebody in and teach them um, how to make a pizza. Mm -hmm. or how to take an order so and the best way usually is them watching it being modeled and then actually performing the task in repetition you know so that they get that experience and that practice so um functional skills in academics daily life vocational recreation and leisure so it might be teaching them to play basketball or how to take turns in a game or I mean, even how to play a video game, if need be, with each other. So there's like a, there's a large spectrum of things that are taught within the life skills. It's just to make them be a more um, a more um, supported individual once they leave the classroom, right? They have those tools so that they can live their best daily life and and Let engage in those business. right and engage in those leisure activities when they leave so ours is the practice um for the real world and that's really important especially when you have kids that are like very high uh, severe on the autism spectrum where they can't go out there and practice with everyone else and they do need those the practice of those life skills and 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 it works within that group setting because they have that class and it's still it's not like you know so isolated so that is for that do you do you remember that question in particular uh i'm not sure i guess i can look into it and send oh you don't have to. No, you don't have to i just i was just thinking no i don't remember um just the one thing i have like in my campus i work for um lamar cisd so mm -hmm. um Currently, we have a one classroom where students are in there. They are, I wouldn't, I was not sure if that is a life skill, but 90% 90 of the time they're in classroom. They don't go anywhere. Um, there are a couple of kids who have a major anger issue. So like, they, you know, we had a couple of times that the student just got upset and he went through every single classroom and dropped their desk and chairs. Um, and um, the cop, you know, security couldn't do anything because that was, he was, uh, he had that in IEP. Right. Um, so, so it's a manifestation. If their behavior is a manifestation of their disability, so like he has anger issues, he has difficulty, um controlling his emotions and mitigating his response to like conflict is then, that then we're not going to punish him because it is part of his disability and he right. literally is at, right so so we have to principals and administrators have to be a little bit careful with that that they are not punishing students with dif disabilities um for actions that are a manifestation of those well no they didn't uh, right. they just, uh, you know kept him in the classroom right. uh, 
how to, you know. And it is challenging, you know, for the, for the teacher and the campus when you do have those, those behavior incidents that are manifested from the disability because you, you, you can't do much except for talk and sort of like manage that, do the RTI response to intervention. So here's one thing I don't understand is um, we have quite a few kids from housing. Is that what they call mm -hmm. um, special housing? I guess they, you know, they don't have parents. They just live in a house, I think, okay. through government. Okay. And some of them um, literally don't have that structure, home structure. Okay. <clears throat> they have a special IEPs as long as, as well as they have, they are in a separate classroom because they are just not, interacting with the rest of the group and um, I was like surprised because I wasn't sure why that fall into that particular class I don't like, know why that would fall into that particular class um, are, are they part of the, the special ed umbrella or are they just economically disadvantaged and that's why they were well like like I said I'm I don't know anything the history about it but what I was told and I've seen with my own eyes is that there were like three kids and all three of them were in under special ed they had IEP they had a, okay. a BIP also and um, none of them were into in in, in a normal classroom structure um, all of them were placed under that same particular classroom but we had two of them one of them was severe with the disability disability who right. couldn't even you know do anything or walk or had just literally came and talk um another one was just the emotionally and maybe a little more i so yeah. i wasn't sure which one falls I into like they that. both would be life skills a little okay. bit um okay. yeah because remember it's it's um it's that learning disability but also like behavioral also emotional those those um operationally defiant students um that we get that also are supported through those those um ls classrooms those that can't interact with other people because they have no control over their anger um and and will lash out so you don't always have behavioral issues with with special ed it's it's usually, yeah yeah so it's usually a, a, an, an issue like you said they don't have parents there's really no structure and and when we see students lash out or at least my experience in my 15 years in the classroom was anytime a student was upset or lashing out in some way, it was always their anger came from like fear or frustration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, so that's how I always deal with, with a student that's angry. Like I, I try to think of it. Okay. They're not angry. What they really are is scared or frustrated. Let me see how I can alleviate that. And I think that is what my biggest thing is, what I see in the classroom, that's what I try to answer it, <laughs> and then reality multiple choice, and then I get screwed because that's not reality, you know, in a whole world of testing, everything is perfect, so I, my mind doesn't go there, it just goes into what my experience is. already know, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the PPR, and even this one, is, is a theoretically based exam a theoretical exam right so in theory this is exactly what should happen in the classroom based on the standards that they gave you and and really what you'll see is that the answer questions it'll be a standard that's that's happening so the teacher will be preparing and adapting and organizing materials to to implement developmentally appropriate and age appropriate lesson plans so there might be a question talking about how you're in this high school class and um, the group of students is high school, let's say life skills, and you, your students are on the cognitive level of middle school students, you wouldn't be doing the cognitive level assignments of high school students, right? right? You right. would know to make any adaptions from what their te their reg the regular ed teachers give, you would be able to make those um, 
adaptations of on grade level to where they were cognitively, but not watering it down to where it's like baby work, right? So right. in the scenarios, what they do is they give you a scenario and then the answer choice is gonna be the teacher doing one of these standards. Right. Executing one of those standards. Um, and let me show you just very briefly the, both of these, um, here it is. Both of these documents I'm gonna send with you so you can use the, the PDFs. And then I'm also gonna send you this one and I know that you are, yes, I know that you've already done the PPR before, but these ideas still come out because Pedagogy just means the, the theory of teaching, the way that we teach everyone. So for the PPR, the first domain is over how students learn, like the way they develop, at what rate do they mature, how do they develop cognitively on a normal basis, and you have to have that in order to be able to identify what is abnormal, or should I send this student who is having difficulties to be seen by someone because they're not on par with where they should be academically, cognitively, maturity-wise, um, and even physically, right? So it still is um, important to look over these ideas and just to remember them when you're taking the exam. For instance, motivation, the way to get students motivated, whether they're special ed or they're regular ed, is to make it intrinsic, and that's hard. And the way that we can do that is by giving them a little bit of ownership with assignments, allowing them to choose um, maybe a topic for a lesson or a hobby or a book, um, classroom management, helping them decide what, what um, rules would work best for the goals that you guys have and having a, a discussion about that. They will be more motivated to abide by the rules if they had a hand in creating the rules, if they feel like they're semi-authors in the rule, right? They came into like some verbal contract. But we start from the big picture, okay? This is what we need to accomplish this year. What do we need to do in order to, like what kind of classroom to what? When we're at group activities at the table, what behaviors need to happen in order for us to be successful in our endeavors? So giving them, um, ownership is going to make them and obviously there's those intrinsic things giving them stickers giving them um compliments when they achieve things and this is especially important for for special ed teachers because you know um coming in and sitting down and getting to work may not be that big of a deal but if somebody has a learning disability where I have difficulty staying on task and remaining attention saying hey i like the way you came in here and you just got right on it that was awesome you know and just knowing that give any opportunity you have to bolster the student's sense of self and identity and give them that positive reinforcement with behaviors that you want to reinforce is going to be important um Obviously learning in styles is important. It's especially important when you have IEPs and you know what works best for students to remember that you take that into consideration when you're making those um, adjustments. Did you see a lot of ELL questions on, on um, your practice exam or any? Yeah, there were a couple of them. I think um, here's my background in ELA. I was in ESL uh, when I, came here from uh, Africa. So I've never had the proper structure and foundation. So when you're talking your, about- your, your speech, your phonemes, like everything, it's, your enunciation is perfect. Well done. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, but I always look down on myself because I feel like I don't have that. You thought. shouldn't, my dear, let me tell you. Do you know that you use more of your brain than, than like 80% of the world simply by knowing English as well as you do and your uh, native tongue as well? So do not feel bad. And um, it's really not, it, it's not, e English isn't the easiest language, right? No, it's not. Trust it me, it changes constantly. Right. But 
there are steps and structures to the way in which we introduce the different components of teaching English. Right. So in that type of way, it will not be so challenging. But what you accomplish by yourself without seemingly any, you know, deep in instruction is fantastic. You know, well done. <laughs> like, and, you. and you will be um, a model and you'll be surprised how many adults who, who speak English as a second language feel this way. Like they, and they don't know as much when you do and what you've done is is far well and beyond what any of us who speak only i speak two languages too but other people who speak only just english mm -hmm. english is not easy to learn but um there are ways in which we can bolster student success giving students um every opportunity to practice their speech and their, their speaking and their listening skills mm -hmm. is so important in the beginning they need to listen to people who can articulate proper english right, and model it properly. And that's through other peers who are native English speakers and ourselves in group interactions. And a lot of times we have, which is, is sad, but in public schools, we have a, an overlap that we see with special ed and ELL. And that is not to say that there is a high incidence of special ed and ELL students. What it is, is that when we get students who are beginner, English language proficiency students, right? They're, uh -huh. they're at the beginning level, which they don't, they cannot speak anything other than, than, than their native language. And so in an English classroom, they are not going to um, ask for clarification. You might ask them a question and they'll look at you sort of like quietly and stare not to be rude, but because nobody likes to feel like they're dumb and they don't know what to say. And so that in itself and that, that um, that frequency to get embarrassed, yeah. ashamed, yeah. will make the student pull into themselves and withdraw Mm -hmm. And then they will be labeled also as special ed as a learning disability, but it literally is a language barrier. And oftentimes we see by the time that they get to those older grades that they aren't indeed special ed, that it really was just a language barrier. So we do like to encourage all of our teachers to be extra careful when they are identifying their students, um, especially those that they've identified that had those overlaps, that they make sure it is in fact a learning disability and not a, a language. Yeah, I've been there, so I'm very, very careful. But I think math is very just, the you know, it is right or wrong. So if the skill is not properly there and the kids are not able to retain it, and after you're teaching it for the fifth time and it's not able to, you, you know that there's something going on. Is, you know learning That's right there's not there's something where it's not making the connection right. between instruction you know the english is a little different because obviously that falls into esl and so i think it, it's harder to distinguish between both the you know is it student with e, you know english language learning uh problem or is it like a disability or students not able to be i think i can understand that would be a little trick tricky to do that yeah so, and, and you know, our, our ELL students, they have a really difficult task because they have to be on grade level yeah. with all their native English speaking peers. So they're learning all the academics. And if you'll look at here, you'll see BIX. These are the two, oh, it's not gonna highlight. Do you see it here where it says ELLs? Uh -huh. So you have BIX is your basic interpersonal communication skills. And that's the basic language of social settings. Like, social skills right right if you, have you seen any movies obviously not because we're in an international pandemic how is your mother doing how was your weekend um what's your favorite book all of these different just non-academic or content specific vocabulary just anything basic to get in with your, your lives that mm -hmm. takes they say two to three years that's if everyone is doing what they need to be doing everybody's practicing those organic conversations where they're speaking giving the student opportunities to listen listen enunciating speaking slowly um once we have that basic inter interpersonal communication skills then we can build on with those um 
cognitive academic languages, that language terms that we have, like um, mitosis, denominator, you know, um, metaphors, oxymorons, all of those very academic specific, content specific languages, they cannot build on those. But we're asking them to at the same time. So we're going through all of these academic things at the same time building their language skills. So they have a really sort of a daunting task, but they do it. And, and it has been my experience that my ELL students, they end up being amazing writers, just even above what native English speakers, once they get to that advanced high, that advanced high um, level. So for my biggest issue that I noticed with the ELA um, for the testing purpose, is that the stages of the learning for the English, um, for basically the kids with the kindergarten, they they ask me questions about, um, I guess, reading fluency, Mm -hmm. They missed like five questions. I mean, five words. That means fluency in versus the stages of the um, struggling. I'm, I'm just, I have never taught ELA. And, right. um, so that was like a big challenge for me. I was not able to answer the questions okay. in regards to that. And then there was a question about, um, there was a question about reading. And there was a communication question. The students was not able to talk to anybody. And why was he, what was wrong with him? Was it a sped? Was it an English barrier? Was it okay. those? Okay. So. And what, um, man, I wish we could take a look at them. Um, I'm going to get for you something really quickly. on the green page. STR components, TEA. Oh, come on. <clears throat> okay, so not the reading academies, phonemics curriculum, reading advisory. Okay, we're going to do this. Okay. Okay, sorry, my computer is being so slow. Yeah, I think it's just everybody's feeling right now. It's afternoon time and <laughs> search. This is an excellent website that the um, state provides for us. And it has a wealth of activities you could use with your, um, with your students. Let me reset this. Oh. 
Right. So, um, you have, um, um, phonics, word recognition, which is more themes, right? So those, mm -hmm. those word parts, I'm trying to look for it because it's a really great one where it comes all together and you could just click through it and let me see if I can find it for you. But fluency is their ability to read fluently out loud. And so the way that we check for fluency is you give them a piece of text and um, they read it and you, you, you see how many miscues they have. How many mistakes they have out of a hundred words and so if they have more I think it's the five miscues then that's their frustration level they're above their reading level their fluency for that reading level is not good so you'd have to move it down we want them in an instructional um, sort of buffer where they don't get everything right they might miscue one or two or three things words Mm -hmm. That's instructional. That means that we can instruct them and build. If they miss too much, a student will shut down and they will not engage with the text anymore. So at that frustration level um, of fluency, they, they're going to shut down. Nobody likes to feel dumb. They're reading out loud. If I've already misspoken seven words, that's it. I'm done. I'm, I'm not going to read anymore. Mm -hmm. But the way that we test for it is we give them um, a sample text with 100 words and we see how many miscues they have. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm really, so you can see them. Phonemes, morphemes, you have syntax, which is the sentence structure, um, semantics, which is the meaning, right, the meaning that is given from the words that we make. I need to review those things because I've forgotten it. I don't use it a lot. So Right, absolutely. And let me just show you because I think it's in here, if I'm not mistaken. So let me go to English. Um, here it is, So we're going to go to ELA. Okay, understanding English. I know I saw it here. Language arts ninety five. Mm. No. Oh, here we are. I was like, oh my God, where's all the content stuff? I was telling you it was so rich in content. And I'm like, okay. So phonological awareness. Mm -hmm. A subskill of um, the, so that's what the phonemes is the first part. So we have to start at the basic sound. What is this letter and what is sound does it make? So teaching phonemic awareness and these are ways that you can do it and and you don't really have to take a whole lot of time looking over these. Just be cognizant that we do teaching phonetical phonetical awareness is so important um, for our students. Here's the alphabetic principle that you scored uh, a little bit lower on, and, and it refers to the use of the letters and how there's that letter sound correspondence, and that um, each letter represents that phoneme. And that the way that you group them together makes different sounds. Um, the way that we develop it through modeling. But this isn't what I'm looking for. I want to find you the exact, there's like five, it's, um, do right now. Let's 
So you have um, phonetics, word recognition, and within that, you also have decoding. So like decoding skills, what prefixes, suffixes, um, that would be a way for them to decode morphemes, which are, are you know, word parts. Um, and then, And then we have um, oral language and vocabulary. So oral language is also really important and it's, and it's one of the deciders as far as how reading and how um, well you're able to learn how to read, how, how easily you can identify phonemes or recognize them is the oral language or oral language skills. So um, before they come to the classroom, before they get to, um, an early child classroom, whether it's pre-K or whether it's kinder, how is their oral language? What vocabulary do they use? What speech sounds? What sentence patterns do they use? And that is gonna be a pretty good indic uh, indicator on how strong the reading is going to be because many times when a student comes and let's say their parents work all the time and they're, you know, they're, whatever the case may be, and their oral language is not strong. They're quiet, it's one or two word responses, maybe three or four word sentences. Um, you will have to build, teachers will have to build that oral language the same way that we would build the BICs in our ELL students through modeling, through organic interaction with other students so that their oral language and with more contact with vocabulary. So that's what we, we come into contact, we build that vocabulary with our students. And it's important that with everything we read, because I know a lot of ELA, and this is ELA teachers, I know a lot of ELA teachers who will not seek out extra vocabulary than the curriculum says. If, the, if they're reading these stories and the literature book said, these are the vocabulary words and those are the vocabulary words that went over and that was it. We know that that's not the best way, not even like a good way of doing it. You have to read the things that you're presenting to your students beforehand, whether it's an expository text, whether it's a um, how to, an article, a story. If we have to read through them and we have to know our audience, which is our students, and, and be able to predict what words would give them difficulties. And these are any kind of words, and not just like academic fancy words. If they don't know what actually means, that's one of what we might talk about. That might be one that, that we go over, you know, or tardiness, whatever it may be. If you think you know your students, each teacher knows their students, where they are on their oral language development, where they are on their um, sort of comprehension, cognitive level, and where the holes may be in a curriculum that is made for everyone in a grade level. So being able to, and, and having the practice of identifying vocabulary that, you're, that you know your students are gonna have difficulties with and doing a pre-teach before you begin reading um, and then using those best practices, um, which include the, um, the diagram with the word in the middle, the fair model, and you have what the, the dictionary definition, right, is the denotation. You might have synonyms of what it is. Uh, it, some people do different things. Some people have a non-example, like what is it not? But almost always, and it should be that you have it, also a visual. Because our ELL students, our students with learning disabilities, they need that visual to make the connection between the new information, which is the, the you know, the definition that I learned, and the image so that I can put it in my, make it part of my prior knowledge, make that association and make it mine so that it becomes prior knowledge and I can use it later. So building oral language and building vocabulary, so, so important. Um, comprehension. Reading comprehension is sort of like the, the 
what the last tiers, comprehension and, and fluency, um, text-driven comprehension. So you have phonemic awareness with phonemes. You have um, word recognition, word breakdown and decoding with the morphemes and the word parts. You have um, syntax, which is the sentence structure and semantics, um, what meaning is garnered through both words and structure syntax then you have your oral language development and fluency with with reading and comprehension comprehension is sort of like the last tier so comprehension mixes the text with the sounds and they make a connection to the brain with the prior knowledge to create understanding and meaning that higher meaning that comprehension um, of the overall text and the difference between the science of teaching reading and the way that we've we've taught things um traditionally or since like i don't know forever i, I, I went to a training with all these very um veteran reading teachers who have said i've taught 40 years of students wrong incorrectly but we always focus more on the comprehension and we didn't help the students learn to decode strong enough and properly to where it would not they would be able to decode and understand that comprehension the reason for the breakdown in comprehension is there are words they do not understand that they cannot make associations with, that they don't have links to pictures and non-examples and real examples. And so us building that in bulk in the beginning really decreases comprehension issues at the end. And so Texas is sort of re redoing all of it and, and we're all gonna be trained so that we can be more proficient in helping support our, our students that are learning to read at all levels. Yeah, okay. so I'm going to send you the Mometrics. I'm going to send you this. I'm also going to look for and find, not while you're here, but the breakdown of the um, English language learning development and the different, the different um, areas, the phonemic area, morphemes, and, and what you should specifically pay attention to. That's fine. I just had a question for you sure, about, um, so, I mean, when you're talking about all these things, it sounds great, but I'm not sure when it comes down to questioning, <laughs> I right. probably will choke. Um, well, we're going to, we'll have to look at some, we're going to look at questions. Okay. We'll to look, we're uh, going to look at questions to see if you, if we get those ideas. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So what we'll do is before um, before we finish our five um, days, we will go through each one of these. And if you want, I don't know if you have access to your Pearson um, or two forty two tutoring, but you can bring those up, and we'll we will dissect these um, in detail. Okay. Yeah. Um, one more thing uh, before you go. Just no, 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 no. We also have to talk about when our next meeting is. Um, since I have to do all this, let me see. Can we do it on Friday? Sure, absolutely. We certainly can. Let's see. Friday the 22nd, right? Yes, right At before we go into Memorial Week. What's At 1 p.m.? Yeah. Yes. Okay, awesome. I'll try to see if we can do twice a week to okay. get this going. Sure. Um, I'll just purchase the second one around once we're done. But my thing is, again, you know, I will be prepared and everything, think I got it. And then when I go through the testing, um, the scenarios are so long. Right. And time you read the question, you forgot half of the scenario. And then the questions and the multiple choices, and you forgot the question. So, right. So, go um, to the question first and say, What is the question asking me? What is the goal of this educator in the scenario? Is it to promote student independence? Is it to um, build a stronger classroom culture with diversity? What is her task? 
What is the point or the goal that she has to? And if you have that, that sort of framed in your mind, it will be easier to choose out the keywords from the scenarios. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's and we'll where I feel we'll need to f focus on that because that's where I am, you know, um, I could be studying and learning all this and then the time Absolutely. really, it's like, whoop. Absolutely. So what we could do is the last two days, if you want, we'll just do questions. We'll just dissect okay. questions. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so um, Friday at one, and you're going to send me a couple of things today. Um, and then I'm going to try to do the Pearson testing today. Okay. Well, you said there was a $10 one, right? Yes, there's a $10 Pearson testing. And that one does, I think, give you the breakdown of by, by domain. And um, you can actually go to it. So next time, if you want the ones that you got incorrectly, we can take a look at them. I'll share uh you can share your screen and we'll we'll dissect some of those that come on that exam as well that's great and uh, like you said that you said um domain two and three has been uh struggling for most of the people that's right. so i mean eventually like that's what i want to focus on yeah absolutely. yeah so i think it will help out after when we go through this thing so Okay. So we'll do cool. domain two, domain better. three, and then do um, testing um, critical reads on the last two? Sure. Okay. I, like I said, I want to do twice a week. Okay. So uh, right now, that's what I'm leading to. The so thing more I have a practice, the better comfortable and confident I will be when oh, I'm absolutely. testing. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I hope I, you can't get too riled up. Do you meditate? Do you have headspace? You should download it. It's really great. <laughs> I'd run. Just meditate for a little bit before you take the exam. Actually, I, um, it doesn't matter how much meditation and I work out and exercise and, you know, I go to the spa and everything. I just get freaked out as soon as I step in. Okay. I think something is just I had a, such a bad experience. And like I said, the 